you very much, Professor Gosset. We will now move on to Professor Sanila. Thank you. Okay. It was great. Yeah, I, I'm happy uh, I came to Valencia in order to, to hear you and have a few discussions with you because I had been trying to have discussions with you for years. We've never uh, met. <laughs> <laughs> we know each other uh, work, but uh, I'm happy to come back to, to Spain in order to, to pursue the, the discussion. That's great. Uh, I'm, I feel a, a little embarrassed and even ashamed that I have to address to you in my poor uh, English. Uh, about 20 years ago I took lessons, uh, Spanish lessons, and uh, I even got good marks, but sounds like <laughs> the knowledge I gained from those lessons is, is sheerly theoretical. So maybe I registered to some philosophy of the la a Spanish language course without being aware of it, so it has no practical consequences uh, whatsoever. I'm going to have to work on that. Um, um, what uh, I think my the, the title of my uh, presentation is a pretty clear uh, question, and I want to start by going straight uh, spoiler alert. Um, I'm going to give the answer to the question uh, right from the start. The answer is no. Uh, I don't think that philosophy or philosophies of recognition can uh, make sense of uh, the claims for recognition of. Uh, extra legal or aboriginal, aboriginal legal orders. Uh, so if you hope the answer would be yes, you will be disappointed. Um, I want to I wanna stress that it's not because the philosophy cannot make sense of this that another type of discourse uh, can't do it either. And essentially, uh, my conclusion was that uh, the, the, the legal uh, material, legal literature, legal doctrine, and the rule of law principles uh, can make sense of uh, that type of struggle much more than philosophy. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, what was my, my doctoral research. So my, my dissertation was, I had it was published uh, as a book. So the whole argument uh, spanned through with, uh, more than 500 pages, but uh, I, I don't think that was necessary. I think in, in a few minutes I can, I can make sense of, the, of, of, of that research, even though I, I, I worked on this uh, for 10 years, because I'm very slow. Um, uh, so uh, it all started from a, what I call a very complex legal problem. Um, one of the main challenges uh, Canadian constitutional law uh, is facing, uh, apart uh, uh, systemic discrimination on others, uh, other topics, of course, but uh, is um, the uh, Aboriginal uh, rights and treaty rights challenge. So when Canada managed to realize a substantial constitutional reform, the only way after, the only time after 1867, was uh, 1982. Uh, the people know a lot about the, the uh, transfer of the constituent uh, jurisdiction and about the, char the Constitutional Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but what is a little less known is that the, the 1982 Constitution Act constitutionalized uh, Aboriginal rights uh, and treaty rights. Um, so, Aboriginal peoples in Canada have a formally constitutional right to the land. And uh, even though uh, this right is uh, recognized by the case law, and it has been recognized as a infra-constitutional right for, for decades, uh, but it's now con formally constitutional, constitutionalized since 1982. So the case law recognizes that right, but it's, the case law is filled with uncertainties, uh, which means those rights uh, are a source of legal uncertainty. The best uh, way to solve or settle those claims and that problem and to, to manage and to uh, ensure legal uh, certainty is to to sign a treaty, uh, an agreement, and as well as uh, 
far as those treaties uh, recognize rights to the Aboriginal uh, party to it, those rights have constitutional status. So the idea is to exchange uncertain rights for rights that are clearly defined into a treaty which has the same status, the same status legally speaking. The thing is that huge work field, national work field of negotiation of treaties uh, has been historically hindered by the fact that Aboriginal peoples don't want to uh, give up their rights. So as a legal problem, it's, it seems uh, uh, impossible to understand from the state perspective, uh, you can't have it both. You can't you can have uh, the, con the continued recognition of Aboriginal rights and treaty rights with, with no exchange. And you can ask for uh, more uh, specifically defined rights and not wanting to exchange them for, for uh, uh, against uncertain rights. So, uh, historically, the, the federal government had a very rough time understanding the uh, Aboriginal people's position. Legal theory um, allows us to, un to, to understand the problem. Uh, the, the way out is to understand that there's a quiproquo, uh, there's a misunderstanding of what both parties are um, have in mind when they speak of rights and even the law. So for Aboriginal peoples, those rights they don't want to give up are not rights that are derived or uh, that come from state law. They come from their own traditional, customary, um, Aboriginal legal system. So. They're not talking about the same thing when they talk about Aboriginal rights. And when, once we uh, understand that, then the problem can be solved. So there, there are many ways in which you can ask Aboriginal people not to, uh, uh, to give up their Aboriginal rights as Abor Aboriginal rights per se, but you can ask them to uh, give up their Aboriginal rights as, rec as they're recognized by the Canadian case law in order to exchange them with another form of a more specific and precise form of recognition of state legal effects of uh, a different and extra legal, uh, uh, an extra state, sorry, legal uh, system. So the so-called paradigm of legal uh, pluralism uh, gives us, uh, provide us with a, an answer to what is possible. So we know it's possible. Uh, most of my, uh, most of constitutional experts, even on Aboriginal law, um, uh, stop the reasoning here, like legal pluralism is the answer. But legal pluralism explains what's possible. It doesn't tell us anything about why it's uh, normatively desirable to do that. And it doesn't make sense of the, the normative charge of the claim. Because uh, for Aboriginal people, uh, it's not only a possible solution, it's a matter of justice. So, it, and the, the words they use, uh, the language is that of recognition. So, it's in their discourse, and it, 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 was, um, it, it, it was given notice by, uh, it was noticed by the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. So it's, it, it's, uh, it's the language of the, the main conclusions of the, the, the Federal uh, Canadian Commission on Aboriginal Peoples that the, the key the key to the issue is a, ma it's, is a matter of recognition. So, how is the recognition of 
another legal system, an extra state system, uh, a matter of justice. Why would justice require to recognize other legal systems? Many uh, people uh, just uh, took for granted that the politics of recognition, as we find it in, in Charles Taylor works, uh, for instance, would be the philosophical explanation to, to the issue. And I tended to think it was as well. So that was my sort of my starting uh, point when I uh, when I, I registered to the doctoral studies. So my hypothesis was that something like the uh, thorough application of Charles Taylor's work to that legal problem through uh, the, the uh, paradigm of legal pluralism would make uh, a great dissertation out of all this and it would take me a couple of years. Uh, but it, it took more, much more time than that. Why? Because it didn't work this way. So I'm, I'm telling you the story. Um, if you take uh, Charles Taylor's politics of recognition, I, I have to say uh, the, that famous paper, which was uh, written after the, a speech he gave, is very interesting, but it's still a philosophical sketch. It's not very detailed. It's like uh, a collection of rather uh, loose ideas and loose uh, references to Hegel and Mead uh, and so on. And uh, basically, um, Taylor come, come, comes up with uh, a, a an idea of two main struggles for recognition. There's one that is that has a legal nature or character, and there's another one that is more, that is extra legal and is about uh, valuing the recognition of value to minority cultures. So, uh, minority cultures can uh, need, can be in need of legal protection, and that can come. Uh, through uh, 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 individual rights and, and special group group rights and institutional uh, um, uh, institutional uh, accommodation, but Taylor had something more you know, important and original in mind, uh, uh, which was that that beyond uh, that traditional legal approach to the problem, we have to. Uh, to presume that uh, other cultures have some value and uh, even though we're, we can be morally uh, justified and allowed to criticize other cultures, before doing that we have to make sure we have sufficient knowledge of, of those cultures so that a just, like morally, politically just society uh, has to, to uh, focus on education and, 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 and the promoting of minority cultures. Uh, well, that sounds great, but here my problem was the rec that of the recognition of legal cultures. So if we apply that framework to what was my problem, there would be the, uh, the idea of the, of the legal protection of legal culture. So that means there's two, two senses, two meanings of what the law is or could be. And then there's another question, which is what does give a given legal culture some value? How, how are we to evaluate the value of a legal culture? So what is, what is the, what is the, the the, the purported value, or uh, what, what kind of value does a legal system must aim at? Um, then I, sorry, I, I switched to um, Axel Unit because, well, I knew that uh, way before um, Taylor published his uh, his famous paper, Axel Unit. Uh, who was a friend of Taylor, Taylor had, uh, and invited him at McGill um, as a, a fellow uh, researcher. And I know Annette had been working on recognition for years. Um, 
and uh, Axel Honneth's books on uh, the struggle for recognition had been recently uh, translated in, uh, in French. So I uh, went to Honneth in order to, uh, to explore and to, to verify if there were answers to uh, that problem, if I could find some notion of the right to your legal culture or the moral right to uh, the recognition of value to a legal culture. Well, the thing is, not only uh, Axel Honneth doesn't provide for any answers to this uh, specific uh, issue or problem, but it does so all the less that Axel Honneth works are not about multiculturalism at all. And that's fascinating because when his book was translated in English, everybody was making uh, connections and, and uh, everybody was uh, uh, lightening uh, his book with Taylor's works. It was kind of taken for granted that it was one more book on recognition the way Charles Taylor understood of the, of the idea and the concept. And Axel Honneth was kind of trapped with that Anglo-American uh, interpretation, early interpretation of his works, so that he had to answer those uh, objections and questions and issues, and he had to try to specify that his book was not especially about that. And he, well, ba basically, he said that if there's a a, if there are, if struggle for recognition of cultures can be struggle for recognition in his uh, Frankfurt schools, uh, Frankfurt school sense, those struggle have to be subsumed subsumed under his concept of uh, legal struggle for recognition. So, in other terms, Axel Honneth recognized mostly the the historical, sociologic, so social, historical, and philosophical legitimacy of minority culture for recognition that are, that 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 present the, themselves as re, as uh, rights claims. So he said, those struggles fit into my model, my my scheme, my framework. As for uh, that other so-called uh, struggle for recognition of the value of cultures, he, he said, I'm not sure uh, it can fit into my, uh, my framework, uh, which is composed of three principles of recognition. And so the first one is, is uh, the principle of love, and it deals with uh, intimate relationships. The second one is the legal principle of recognition. And the third one is uh, the solidarity one. And so that was a question. Can a struggle for recognition of value of minority culture uh, could correspond to a, a solidarity struggle for recognition? And basically, excellent, I said, I don't think so. It's, 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 it's very different. I'm not, I can't go into the details here. It's in the book, by the way, if you want to read my book. Um, but he said, well, I think to really address these specific claims, um, we would need a fourth great principle of recognition, and I'm, I don't think it exists for now, but maybe it does, uh, so uh, it's for other uh, thinkers to, to, uh, to explore. So, what I found out is that the, what looked like the beginning of interesting uh, path of solution to my problem uh, into philosophy, uh, philosophers' uh, work uh, were arguments or ideas imported from the legal material and the case law, and, uh, and notably international law on human rights. So, at the end of the that research pro uh, process, um, I, I got to the conclusion that. Uh, I went really far reading to the, the uh, 
philosophical material, whereas the, the, the best uh, tools and pieces and ideas are, uh, were to be found into, into the, the, the legal tradition uh, of, of, of thinking. So this is just one uh, case study. So I'm not going to say that philosophy can never be of any use uh, in order to solve very legal, uh, very complex legal problems. But I, I found it interesting, and at least the, the jury, the panel, uh, when I defend, uh, defended my thesis, found it interesting too that we cannot take for granted that philosophy will always um, provide uh, sounder, more profound, better answers when uh, lawyer, um, uh, legal experts uh, find, uh, think, uh, feel, sorry, feel uh, ill-suited or ill-equipped to, to solve the problem. So I think it's, a, it's something we take for granted that where the law gets to a very uh, complex normative issue on which the state of, of the positive law doesn't give any clear answer, Philosophy must be the solution. So it's not it's not that clear. Um, so I'm going to conclude uh, with just a, a, a practical aspect to my my uh, the conclusion of my research. I think if philosophy uh, cannot really uh, help us make sense of the struggle for recognition of a legal order, I think, as I said in the at the beginning of my speech that uh, the rule of law uh, principles and, and literature uh, and, and the case law uh, can help us uh, better. However, uh, the rule of law principles and the international law principles pertaining to human rights, even though if it, it can accommodate uh, those claims of recognition of uh, aboriginal legal systems, for instance, they impose limits on that. Uh, discourse and things. So the very radical otherness legal pluralism discourse is, in my opinion, in incompatible with the rule of law if it goes as far as a radical judicial pluralism. But maybe you could talk about it in, uh, during the discussion because I'm going to stop for, for now. Thanks.